Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Indie Reads Aloud. Today wraps up our reading of the Sydney Lockhart Mystery Series with Kathleen Casca. Thank you, Kathleen, for coming back again. I've really been enjoying this series. I'm so grateful that you're sharing it with us. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun. I'm enjoying this, too. It's super fun. Um, so you have lived the majority of your life in Texas. You're now currently living in Washington State. Um, as we've talked about before, you write two different mystery series, the Sydney Lockhart series and the Kate Carraway Animal Rights Mystery series, as well as nonfiction and uh trivia books too your books are published through a small press emma Cara press in kansas yes um tell me a little bit for those of us who are on that writing journey tell me a little bit of um how you made the decision to go with a small press um rather than to find a traditional press with a small press um you get to work closely with a publisher. And that was important to me. Um, I've published with larger presses before, but I just kind of felt like I was lost among a bunch of other authors. Mm. And the small press, especially Amakara Press, it the, I mean, they're great. I, I meet with a publisher at least once a month on a, in a Zoom meeting, sometimes more. And she's kind of like a mentor as well as a publisher. And I feel that she's uh, vested in my books as much as I am. You know, That's she, awesome. Yeah. And so, and we could talk, oh, we could talk ideas and uh, it's, I just feel comfortable and happy and, and grateful that she's doing so much to promote my books. So Amakara is more than just a publishing house. They're also a partner in your writing career. Yes. I think that's an awesome thing. I'm so glad that you found them. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Driscoll Hotel. Where is this hotel located and what was it that drew you to write a story about it? Okay, the Driscoll Hotel is in downtown Austin, just a few blocks from the state capitol. It was built in 1856 and uh, it's a gorgeous old hotel. I lived in Austin for 25 years. And so I visited the, the Driscoll often, not, not at so much as a hotel guest, but the bars and the restaurants and the events that used to go on there. So it was kind of like the little hub in the downtown area, a great meeting place for friends to go and just hang out. So I knew the Driscoll really, really well. And, um, I, I wanted to include it in this series. Plus, this is this fourth book is where my character Sydney has finally decided to become a private detective. And her agency is set in Austin, which is where she lives. So this is the first book where it is set in her hometown where she lives the so other it's her, so it's her territory rather her than territory. going to unfamiliar territory exactly i felt that was necessary in the series because sydney had been in other locations i felt it was necessary to have her in her hometown where she's investigating so and plus austin is a unique city you yeah know? yeah and, and then of course it's very different in the 1950s when the book was set but uh, it's got it's got a great history, and I I love the place, and so I wanted to to set the book there. That's very fun, awesome. I am looking forward to this. Um, for those of you who have not heard the other episodes, be sure to um, subscribe and uh, do a search on our platforms for the other books in the Sydney Lockhart mystery series. Super fun stuff. My TBR is now bigger than it should be. Thank you for that frustration. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so when you are ready, please take the microphone and read a little bit for us from the murder at the Driscoll. I heard Jelly Bluestein laughing his full head off as I darted out the door in pursuit of the slime ball I was assigned to watch. 
If the guy had only swiped the till, I would have turned round and told Jelly to catch his own thief. But the guy snatched my overcoat on the way out the door. Inside was my new PI license and 50 bucks from our agency's petty cash, making the thievery a personal issue. The man I was after was the bartender at the Blue Mist, a popular sleaze joint on Sabine, a few blocks from the next to nothing live theater. Jelly, the owner of the Blue Mist, came to our detective agency for help. He was certain one of his bartenders had been stuffing his pockets rather than replenishing the cash drawer. My boyfriend partner, Ralph Dixon, advised against taking the case since he suspected Jelly of being as crooked as his employees. But I was eager for our new detective agency to get off the ground. Being a novice investigator, I could use the practice. Besides, the nighttime work would not interfere with my day job. Dixon reluctantly agreed. It was my third night at the bar. My sleuthing required that I dress in male disguise and smoke and drink while trying to keep a low profile, which was easy since most folks came to the blue mist to do that, except for dressing in disguise. But hey, I might be wrong. After all, this is 1953 and weird things happen in downtown Austin, Texas. I suspected this particular bartender the first night. He had a pattern to his pilfering. Once the joint became busy, he moved to the far end of the bar where the overhead lights failed to reach. When someone paid for a drink, the guy pretended to stuff the money into the register but instead executed a flicking motion with his fingers and the bill slid up his cuff. Tonight had been busier than normal and I watched a small fortune fill the bartender's sleeve. At closing time, Jelly came out of the back room and caught my eye. I nodded toward the guilty party. The bartender noticed our sly communication and he suddenly became twitchy. Jelly hurried the and hurried the last drunk out the door, flipped off the neon open sign, and reached for his billy club. In one swift motion, the bartender snatched a wad of cash from the register and my coat off the rack and made a beeline for the door. Since Jelly was too fat to run, I took up the chase alone. I pursued the guy down 6th Street all the way to the Driscoll Hotel, when suddenly he darted down the alley and became swallowed up in the steam rising off the pavement. I thought I'd lost him until I heard a pile of rags bundled near, near the dumpster say, he turned right at the end of the alley, Miss Sidney. I think the guy who I'd come to know as Backyard Benny, a bum who'd earned his moniker by sleeping in backyards and alleyways in downtown Austin. I took off in that direction as a tower of empty food crates tumbled in my path. Thanks to my long legs, I hurled the debris, sending an annoying family of raccoons scattering. In dodging the scavengers, I slipped on their feud, food refuse, regained my footing, and within seconds, I had the guy in sight again. Running down 7th Avenue toward Rev Rev River Street, he headed away from the downtown area and the street lights illuminating the path to the state capitol. My youth and athletic ability gave me the only hope of catching him before he vanished into the crevices of broken down warehouses, or worse yet, into the darkness of Waterloo Park. The guy was at least 20 years my senior and had obviously not graced the inside of a gymnasium since high school but he did have the advantage of being prey, driven by survival and escape. I was about 40 yards behind him when I caught sight of a slow moving mass on the opposite side of the street, a collection of stumbling drunks, or so I thought. When I saw the glint of a switchblade, I realized the drunks were malcontents, intent on relieving late nighters of whatever cash remained in their pockets. The guy paid no attention to the thugs following him. 
he left over a low leapt over a low wooden fence and disappeared behind a vacant house. I pulled my gun from my holster and fired a couple of shots in the air. Someone shouted, cops, and the hoodlums fled. I wasn't often mistaken for one of Austin's finest. It must have been my man clothes. I prayed my long red hair would stay put up under my fedora as I scaled the fence after him. I should have listened to my wise and experienced partner and not gotten involved in this case. I should have also listened to him when he told me to meet him at the office as soon as the bar closed. That was almost an hour ago, but I couldn't let this guy escape. My pride was at stake. If I were lucky, Dixon would head down to the blue mist and Jelly would tell, put him on my trail. If not, I might end up like so many other women who found themselves alone after dark on the bad side of town looking for trouble and finding it. My gun would do me little good if a thug switchblade found its way between my ribs. As I rounded the corner of a three-story warehouse, the side door flew open and caught me in the right shoulder, knocking me to the ground. From the crashing noise, I knew the bartender had dashed inside. I followed, but pulled up short when the door behind me slammed shut and I was clothed in darkness. I stopped and listened. Nothing. No running footsteps. No tumbling boxes. No heavy breathing. Okay, I knew when to quit. I backed toward the door when I heard it. Music. Suddenly, the room lit up like Times Square. I now stood between a headless man and a rabbit whose nose twitched to the beat of my pounding heart. Dracula's image reflected off the blade of a guillotine. I jerked around to, comfort, to confront the Transylvania bloodsucker and came face to face with a girl dressed in organy and lace, a blue sash wrapped around her empire waist and tied in the back with a bow. I could see from the reflection in the mirror behind her on her feet were patent leather Mary Janes in the brightest shade of lavender I'd ever seen. She held a Bible to her chest. When she spoke in her clear, calm voice, I knew it was beyond hope that I'd smell the brewing coffee that would wake me from my nightmare. I blinked twice. She was still there. So I did the only sensible thing. I placed my gun back into its holster and asked her where she bought her shoes. I found them. Who are you? I could ask you the same question. Did you see an old chubby guy running through here? No one's been here all night except me. Why aren't you at home? I am. You live here? She raised her eyes upward. On top, our apartment. I come down here when my dad snores. Do you always dress as if you're going to your first communion? I'm considering a new persona. Dad doesn't like me coming down here at night, but I find the time alone in the prop room playing dress up generates my creative side. Do you play dress up too? The tone of her question was not that of an innocent child. It dripped of sarcasm spoken by a well-seasoned cynic. I looked down at my grubby suit and red cowboy boots inside. I do play dress up, evidently. Listen, I gotta go, and you better go back upstairs before your father wakes up. After he comes home from work, he hits the bed and doesn't wake up until late. He runs the theater next door. The next to nothing theater? Uh-huh. Where's the front door to this building? This way. I followed her through the warehouse, going in one door and out the other, up half a flight of stairs and down a long, narrow hallway when she reached the door and pushed it open. Until now, I hadn't realized that in chasing the guy, we had doubled back. I was back out on 6th Street and Sabine. The blue mist was across the street two blocks away. Then I noticed the marquee for the theater. I stepped back and scanned the structures. 
the warehouse and theater, and apparently the girls' apartment were all in one huge building. We back, went back inside and turn, returned to the prop room. I'm sure that guy came in the back door, I said. He could have. To the left of the door are stairs that lead to the roof. He could have gone up there and down the fire escape. Why are you after him? Let's just say it's business. Show me the roof. Sure. What's your name? She asked, leading me to the stairs. Sydney. No, I mean your real name. You're not a man. Thank you. Sydney with an uh, with a Y. And you are? Florence. But you can call me Lydia with a Y too. Is that a phonograph you're playing? My favorite record. It's a special night. I listened. Billie Holiday singing Blue Moon. Great song. So why is it so special to a young girl like you? Not the song. The night, she scoffed and pushed open the door. Tonight is a blue moon. Only comes around once every 22 months. I was a mere child the last time it happened. I wouldn't miss it this time for anything in the world. I wish it would show itself. It's damn dark out here. It was out earlier for a moment when the clouds parted. It was magical. Sorry I missed it. We stepped out onto the roof and I found the fire escape, which led down into the alley. No use looking for the guy now. He could be halfway to San Antonio. Sorry I bothered your fantasy world, Lydia. Do me a favor and lock up after I leave. There are some dangerous people hanging around this neighborhood at night. Oh, I'm not worried. If the bums around here know you, they pretty much leave you alone. Maybe you should walk me back to my office. Hey, come by tomorrow and I'll get you a ticket for the show. It's great entertainment. I'll do that. I gotta go. Unless you're known around here like me, I'd stay out of the, these alleys. Life is too wondrous and beautiful to squander in the cesspools of the devil. I jerked around. Lydia had disappeared. When I shut the door behind me, I heard the lock click. I pulled out my gun for the eight block stroll back to the office. All of a sudden, the hairs on my arms stood up. I spun around, giving him the opportunity to grab my shoulders and push me back against the wall. You never listen, do you? He said. Get used to it, buddy, I replied. His eyes narrowed. I replaced the gun in my holster and flung my arms around his neck as the wail of sirens drifted off in the distance. We'll never get any work this done this way, Dixon said. It's a blue moon. It's not the blue moon. Believe me. He kissed me to make his point. My knees buckled. Nice. <laughs> Very nice. Lydia is an interesting little character. I love Lydia. I love her. And uh, she's another one of those characters that showed up. And she's in the book and other scenes. And after this book came out, I had so many readers telling me that they loved her. And so she's a regular character now. Nice. Yeah. Don't you love it when your your imaginary friends kind of hang out? It's, yeah. it's kind of fun to, you know, play with the same people. Yeah, yeah, it is. And um, yeah, she's she's just a hoot. And I she's so unusual. <laughs> she's 12 years old, but she's probably smarter than anybody else in the story, you know. Sure. And uh, so yeah, she's she's a keeper. <laughs> um, I'm really curious as an editor myself, um, does Sydney Lockhart's editor make any appearances in these books and because she's going out on these assignments so what's that relationship like with her editor that that's a good question um he does make appearances in the book and it becomes apparent in this book that she's going to have to make a choice she can't go around working for the newspaper during the day and uh running and working at the agency as well. And she's trying to keep him from finding out that she's moonlighting, but then she finally decides to come clean 
and uh, he's angry about it, but yet he understands and he decides to get involved in in a way. In other words, uh, he's okay, if you're going to do this, then you're going to have to do this for me if I'm going to do this for you. So uh, he's an interesting character. His name is Ernest. I like him. He shows up again in this book. So it's uh, maybe that relation starts out in a mentoring situation and then grows into partnership, business yeah. partnership, and, and maybe a little bit of rivalry because he definitely yeah. wants the story for his paper, yes. right? Exactly, exactly. And then, so when she says, I'm going to go do this other thing, he gets a little irritated by that, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but they, they work through it. Uh, she finds out some stuff about him, some personal stuff that he's struggling with. And she, you know, kind of helps him through it. So it, it becomes a, a good working relationship for them. So what's next for you? Is there another Sydney mystery coming out? Is there another Kate Carraway coming? What's next? Well, I am working on Sydney book number seven. Um, I can't tell you the name of the hotel because it's a surprise. <laughs> and fair enough. Fair enough. I hope to have that out uh, sometimes, maybe next so that's fall. Book seven. So you still have to come back and read five and six for us. I read five and six. Oh, that, that's right. Oh, yeah. You did that before. Yeah, right. That's right. I, okay. Yeah, I read yep. um, Murder at the Minger, which is five, set in uh, San Antonio. Right. And I remember. Murder at the Poncha Train, number yep. six, in New Orleans. Right. Okay. So, on number seven, I have hotel number eight in mind, and I have hotel number nine in mind. And if any of your listeners have hotels that they want me to consider, I'm open to hearing about them. That's an awesome idea. Okay. Anybody who has a hotel, <laughs> contact me at the podcast and we'll connect you. Absolutely. Um, so what about Kate? Is there more coming from her? Possibly. Okay. I, I've been working on a, I kind of put her on hold for a little while because I wanted to write a different one and I just finished it. It's a quirky British mystery series or mystery. Okay. And I just finished that. And so I'm going to be shopping that around, uh, looking at some uh, publishers from the UK and um, terrific fun. Yeah. So I'm writing all sorts of different things. That's I like awesome. to tell people that I, I like to write what I like to read. Mm -hmm. So I think, if, I think we all do that. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Do. So I'm, I'm having fun, you know. That's very exciting. Well, I'm looking forward to you coming back and reading for us again when book seven comes out, and maybe when this British thing comes out too. Yes. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you, and we'll look for more books in the future. Sounds good.